Hello, my name's Helen Walden and I'm based at the University of Dundee's um, MRC Phosphorylation and Ubiquitylation Unit. And I'm opening this afternoon's session on the structure and function of Parkin and how we can use structure and molecular detail to understand Parkin's E3, E3 ligase activity. And I will frame the session with an overview of our current understanding of Parkin function and finish up with some of the outstanding questions that remain in the field. So one of the most fascinating aspects to Parkin, to me, is the fact that it seems to have so many putative substrates assigned to it. So a recent high-profile screen from Wade Harper's lab yielded some 450 proteins that become ubiquitinated in a Parkin-dependent manner. And these targets are found in multiple cellular locations, and they appear to be targeted at multiple sites. So this extensive repertoire is unheard of in ubiquitin biology. There are no other ligases that have uh, this extensive list of substrates. And indeed, members of the same family as Parkin have very poorly defined target lists. So Parkin is purported to play a major role in mitophagy, the clearance of damaged mitochondria. And in support of this, many of the candidate substrates highlighted here are found in the outer mitochondrial membrane. For example, the mitochondrial Rho GTPase, Miro1 or Rop1, has been shown by Miritol Mukit's group to be directly ubiquitinated by Parkin in vitro. So Parkin is a multi-domain protein, and each domain has pathogenic patient mutations that are associated with it. And shown here is the, uh, a mixture of the high-resolution Ring0 RBR domains with the lower-resolution UBL domain, it's shown in green, modelled in. So the colours of the schematic across the top match the uh, structure. Now, we showed in 2011 that Parkin is not a constitutively active molecule, and in fact it's auto-inhibited by the UBL domain. And the recent crystal structure from the Fon and Gehring groups shows that there are multiple interactions between domains. For example, the ubiquitin-like domain packs against the ring 1, and the ring 0 sits on top of the required for catalysis RCAT domain. And patient mutations in different domains have different effects on Parkin activity. For example, in the ubiquitin-like domain, there are single point mutations that are sufficient to render um, Parkin active for auto-ubiquitination, and this is both in vitro uh, and in a cellular context. And very recent work this year has shown that phosphorylation of ubiquitin by PINK1, another Parkinson's disease protein, leads to the activation of Parkin. And this has opened up a whole slew of questions, which brings me to my final slide. So Parkin must now be one of the best structurally characterised ubiquitin ligases. There are high-resolution crystal structures, lower-resolution crystal structures, solution structures, low-resolution full-length structures in solution, and yet we still don't understand fully how it works. For example, there are many questions such as how is it activated by phosphoubiquitin and what happens to Parkin itself post-activation. And I started this talk with an overview of the substrates. And one thing that the structures have so far failed to give up its secrets is how Parkin recruits all of those substrates. And so with that, I'd like to finish um, and thank uh, my lab and obviously members of the field who've uh, produced a lot of the structural data um, and, uh, and really framed where the next set of questions come from.